Well, hello, everybody. Great to be back with you for Theology Tuesday as we continue in this study of James. It's awesome to be with you. Hopefully you're enjoying this, so I want to encourage you, take a moment right now. Go ahead, like and share the feed. Uh, make sure you've invited someone to join you tonight, wherever you're watching us on. If you're on New Life's Facebook, if you're on the app, if you're on my Facebook page, maybe you're watching us on theology.online.church. We've tried to create um, as many possible reference points for you to get involved and to share. We really want this to be a community experience. And as restrictions are starting to lighten all across the country, uh, particularly here in Washington State, as we're starting to hear more and more information about what reopening looks like, I want to encourage you to stay connected to the community. I want to take a second and uh, talk to you about one way that you can begin to create some awesome moments of community on your own throughout the week. And those are what we're calling meetups. Um, meetups are just uh, about 25 minute, either Zoom call, Skype call, FaceTime, however you wanna connect. Just get four or five friends together. Some of you, maybe uh, if you were part of Theology Tuesday, get your table together, uh, get some friends together, get family across the country together. And all we want you to do is uh, ask each other a few questions, uh, connect with each other. How are you doing? How are we feeling? What's going on? Connect with God in terms of praying for each other, anything that you're facing, anything that you're going through, anything you feel like you could maybe use a little help from God with, all those sorts of things. And then the other thing we want you want to do is really connect over God's Word together, specifically the message. You know, each week we kind of do a few messages or a few questions with the message. And so just go ahead and ask some of those questions with each other. You can go to nlchurch.com slash meetups. Make sure everyone puts it in the chats there nlchurch.com slash meetups. And if you want to lead one of those meetups, go ahead, click on that. And I encourage you to do, especially those of you who've been table hosts, make sure you reach out to people, say, hey, let's get together on Friday morning or Saturday night. Uh, and uh, let's just talk about the message, talk about what's going on in our lives, take a few minutes and pray with each other. Keep it brief, you know, 20 minutes, uh, but just check in with each other just to make sure everyone's doing okay. Speaking of Saturday nights, we're continuing with Drive-In Church. Uh, on the uh, Renton campus, the central campus. And those are going to be every Saturday night at 7 p.m. going forward. So make sure you're part of Drive-In Church as well. Well, we are continuing in our study of the great book of James, this letter that James is writing to uh, Jewish believers all throughout the Old Testament world. Um, it's unique because it's not necessarily dedicated to one specific geographic location. I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, let's take a moment. And let's pray and let's just ask God's presence to be with us uh, as we gather together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you do in our lives. God, we thank you for how much you love us. Father, now as we look into your word, as we dive into your word, I just pray that you would be with us as we study these passages together, looking through James chapter 1, and that we really begin to glean the information and really glean the heart of what you're speaking to us. We love you. We thank you. We do all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Um, Solomon Northrup, who was a, uh, um, a freed man who was taken into slavery, actually, he was freed, found himself in the South, was captured, taken into slavery, and wrote a book about it called 12 Years a Slave. And he, wrote this, uh, he writes this, he says, At such times, the heart of man instinctively turns towards his maker. In prosperity, and whenever there is nothing to injure him or make him afraid, he remembers him not and is ready to defy him. But place him in the midst of dangers. Cut him off from human aid. Let the grave open up for him. And there it is, in his time of tribulation, that the suffering, the scoffer, excuse me, that the scoffer and the unbelieving man turns to God for help, feeling there is no other hope or refuge or safety save in his protecting arm. What is Northrop saying here? What he's saying is that there are times in life when everything's going fine that we really don't feel the need for God. And I think we're all guilty of that. I think if we were honest with each other and vulnerable right now, um, most of the time, probably we don't even think of God all that much. I mean, sure we do. We're spiritual people and we're religious people and we're faithful people. I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about that constant desire to seek God for wisdom, that constant need to look to God. And the fact of the matter is, is that when things are going great, we tend not to worry about God all that much. Um, but it's in moments, maybe like a crisis, maybe like a pandemic, maybe like what we're in right now. And that's when we feel like we really need to reach out to God. And when Northrop is saying, why can't we have that all the time? And I wonder, maybe ask yourself this question or maybe talk about this in the chats for just a second. But what are some of those moments in your life where you really felt like you needed to look to God for wisdom? 
Maybe it was what's going on right now. Maybe you feel a, a, a huge need to look to God for wisdom right now. I hope you do. Maybe it's in your parenting. You know, we've got a kid who's graduating from high school and, and honestly, her whole future is kind of a big question mark right now. We've got another, you know, uh, another one about to turn 17. Our son who's about to turn 17 is on the, on the edge of adulthood. We have another 12-year-old who's navigating all of the things that being a 12-year-old girl in today's society means. And I just wonder um, how many of us really look to God for wisdom, not just in times of hardship, but in times of prosperity. I would perhaps even argue that in times of abundance, in times of prosperity, in times of everything being relatively easy, that's perhaps when we need to look to God the most for wisdom. So the reason I bring this up is because the context of James seems to suggest that he's writing to these Jewish believers that are enduring some sort of hardship. They are enduring some sort of trial. So get your Bibles out, whether it's digital, maybe you open it up next to this screen. Um, maybe you have a, a paper copy of the Bible. Maybe it's on your tablet, your iPad, whatever you version, whatever you're doing. But point that Bible to James chapter 1 and let's get started. James chapter 1 verse 1. James, a servant of, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there, even though that seems subtle, he is framing everything in the fact that he sees himself as a servant of God and that he, everything he's about to say is rooted in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's assuming that you and I as readers have proclaimed that Jesus is Lord, that, that we have submitted our lives and we've given our lives and we are letting Jesus call the shots. You know, that, that great song, Jesus take the wheel. Is Jesus taking the wheel of your life? And James is saying, if that's so, this is for you. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So he's speaking, he's using language similar to what's called the diaspora. In other words, in the ancient world, in the closing events of the uh, Old Testament, the Jewish tribes were scattered. Israel was broken. Judah was broken. The capital was destroyed. Jerusalem was was raised to the ground. It's burned to the ground. The temple was destroyed. People were in exile. And literally now, rather than being a nation on a geographical, you know, concentrated on, on a slice of geography, God's people are scattered. And that word is diaspora. God's people are scattered. And now he's speaking to them using that same language. He says to my Jewish brothers and sisters scattered across the world, greetings. And then he says this, consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He has, in this one statement, helped us understand what can our perspective towards hard times be? When we are facing, as we talked about last week, a new reality, when we are facing this new weird world that we live in, and it is hard and it's difficult and it's beyond just not being able to, you know, get a toilet paper or buy some flour or go get our hair done. Those are the trivial things. The deep things are the fear that we feel, the hopelessness that we feel, the Maybe even, honestly, the depression or the anxiety, uh, worried about income, worried about what happens next. It's not, the, it's not the luxuries of life, the extra stuff. But many of us feel very core things, our own physical health, all those sorts of things. What is my perspective going to be when I'm faced with those realities? And James challenges us and he says, you know, one way of looking at it is you could actually consider it a joyful thing. And we read this and we think, James, you're, you're just completely insane. This, this makes no sense. But he says, wait, what if you looked at this new circumstance and your suffering and your trials as a process of transformation? What if there are lessons to be learned in this crucible? What if, you know, um, what if there are lessons to be learned in this forge? What if, what if rather than being broken and destroyed, you're actually being forged into something new? He says, let perseverance, let that testing of your faith, you say you believe God, so believe, like dig in and believe, and let that testing of that faith, let that produce perseverance. Let it produce perseverance. 
You know, I've heard uh, a lot of stuff online and I've heard a lot of stuff where people are talking about this is coming against the church, that's coming against the church, these people don't like us, this person's against us, all that kind of stuff. The truth is, is that our church in America is one of the most privileged and protected churches in the world. And I wonder now this tension that we feel is because we, we don't have this perseverance. We're just not, I guess for lack of a better word, we're just not tough. And so James says, rather than whining and complaining about it, why don't you let that process start to change you and produce perseverance and let perseverance finish its work. Let perseverance go all the way because at the end of perseverance is maturity and wholeness. So it's not a command to get over it. It's not a command to be, you know, Pollyanna, uh, don't worry, be happy, um, you know, or Bob Marley, don't worry about a thing. Uh, you know, every little thing's going to be all right. That's not what it is. It's saying, yes, it's owning the fact that times are hard. It's admitting to the reality that things are tough. And he says, yes, now lean into it. Let that do something to you. Let it develop perseverance because at the end of perseverance, that's where maturity and wholeness come from. Maturity and wholeness don't come from life being easy. People whose lives have been nothing but easy tend to be fairly immature people. But people who've had to face things, whatever it is, and, and again, you know, we're all facing different levels of struggle here. I, 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 I will admit that. My level of struggle right now is not that bad. Yours may be incredibly difficult, but for all of us, I can say, okay, I can either shut down to anxiety, I can shut down to depression, and trust me, I'm more than capable of that, or I can lean into it and I say, okay, what is on the other end of this? What lesson, what truth, what character trait, what is on the other side of this? And that's just four verses, folks. This is gonna, this is gonna be intense. And then he says this, if any of you lack, lacks wisdom, so, okay, how do I do that, James? All right, let's say that I agree with you. How do I deal? How do I take suffering? How do I take trial? How do I take hardship? And how do I turn it into something positive? And he says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let them ask God for it, who gives generously to all without falling fault, finding fault, and it will be given to you. If you don't know what to do, let anyone who lacks wisdom ask God for it. Well, I don't know how to handle the poly... Let anyone who lacks wisdom ask God for it. I don't know what to do with my kids right now. It's all so crazy. Let anyone who lacks wisdom ask God for it. I don't know how to talk to my boss about what's going to happen. Let anyone who lacks wisdom ask God for it. Why? Because God will give you wisdom generously. He will not judge. The Bible literally says, finding no fault. He will not judge your ignorance in this situation. He won't judge mine. I don't need to know more in life. I need to be wiser. I need to be more mature. I need to be more complete. The only way any of us are going to get through this in a healthy, productive, stronger way is not through what we know in terms of facts and details, because that's just, we've talked about that. We, no, I mean, I got one, some group of people saying this is the truth. I got another people group, group. I mean, I don't know. I got knowledge. Knowledge I don't have any lack of. What I lack oftentimes in my life and maybe even in your life is wisdom. I need wisdom, God. How should I live in all of this? So what is wisdom? Wisdom is the maturity, the completeness, the common sense, the prudence, all of those things that helps us live with the knowledge we have. It is the expression of knowledge in our life. It is the expression of what we know about God. It's the expression. What good is it, James will get to this, if I know things, but I don't live wisely? He says, when you ask, though, be careful that you don't ask, but you ask and you actually believe it'll come. Because if you don't, you'll be tossed around. And this is his first great natural world metaphor. He says this, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. In other words, he's saying, if you, if you want to hear from God, listen to God. But if you're not going to trust what then the wisdom God gives you, you're going to be thrown around like a wave. 
You're just going to be tossed here and fro because you are not truly focusing on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And how many of us friends, friends, how many of us do that? We seek God for wisdom and then he tells us what to do. And we're like, yeah, I'm like, I, that's not, that's, I, that doesn't sound right. I don't want to do that. Because we may say, God, what do you want me to do with my finances? And he says, well, why don't you tithe and give to the poor? You're like, ah, no, nah, that doesn't sound right. God, what should I do about, um, you know, this family member? And every time we get together, all we do is fight about politics. What should I do? And, it, and his wisdom is going to be, well, you know, think of others more highly than you think of yourself. And don't stir up gossip. Don't, don't stir up strife. Just take one for the team. Turn the other cheek. And he's like, ah, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. What we do is God tells us all the time how we're supposed to live. And then we don't do it because... I don't know. Why don't we do it? Why don't we follow God's wisdom? Pride, arrogance, fear, doubt, all of the above. But James says, if you ask for it and you don't really believe what he tells you, then you're just going to be, you're worse off in some ways. And that instability will stretch out into every corner of your life. He gives this piece of advice. He said, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. Now, James goes on a tear here, friends, and he really, he really plants the rich against the poor. And I don't want to get into the sociology, all of that, and I don't want to get into the economics of all that, but let's just say James says that if you're lower, you should be excited, and if you're higher, you should be worried. Because all of that will go away. All of your wealth, all of your power, all of your influence, your nice home, all of the stuff that you think is more important than loving your neighbor as yourself, everything that I think is more important than trusting God, it's all going to be. And he literally says it will wither. Again, another great natural metaphor. It will wither like a flower in the sun. James says, look for things that last forever. Wisdom from God. And he'll get to this in a second eternal focused religion all of these things verse 12 he jumps down he says blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test that person will receive the crown of life now he's almost echoing what's cool is you can begin to see jesus influence on james he's talking about you know he he's he's sort of starting to echo let's say echo echo the words of the sermon on the mount he's echoing the book of proverbs this idea of look to God and trust in the Lord and blessed are the low and, and, and watch out for people who are up on high. Blessed are the people who, he, he sounds like Jesus. It's almost like when he was following his brother, his, his half brother on earth, although he wasn't following him, he was paying attention. And then when he crossed that line of faith, stuff got real and he came to life. Verse 13, he says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. Don't blame God. God cannot be tempted by evil and he doesn't tempt anyone. You know, there's oftentimes, this is interesting because we can be tested, but we are not tempted. So what's the difference? Tested is God knows what we are capable of. God knows we are capable of more and he wants to awaken something in us. When Satan tempts us, he knows that we are also capable of less and he wants to drive us down. When God tests us, He's trying to awaken something that will pull us up. So don't call it tempted. Each person is tempted when they are dragged by their own evil desire. That's what temptation is. You are enticed. And then desire is conceived. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So don't blame God. But look at very... Now, we're getting to the crux of it. Hardships come. Ask God for wisdom. Rejoice that you can grow and be strong. But do not use your hardships as an excuse for why you are sinning. Don't blame God on that. You know, I've heard a lot, um, honestly, some pretty hard stories about pandemic and quarantine situations. People blaming quarantine on being more angry. People blaming shelter in place on sinful behavior. People blaming shelter in place even on... Um, domestic violence and acts of violence in their homes. And all I can say is, it's not shelter in place's fault. James will make it very clear later on that the things that come out of us are embedded in us. It was already there. And so what James is going to say is, what will you give into? It is that easy. 
It's very easy to blame our faults and our sin and our disobedience on something else. And James says, no, don't blame it on God. Don't blame it on your circumstance. Ask God for wisdom. Look at your circumstance as a chance to grow. If you want to sin, you will sin. You will feed it. You will entice. You will feed temptation. Temptation will give birth to sin. And then when sin grows up, it brings it. It then gives birth to death. So if sin is the child of temptation, then death is the grandchild of temptation. But if I look at my life as God is trying to awaken something in me, and I will lean into this situation, don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. This is verse 18 now. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of a first fruits of all he created. So he's saying, don't be deceived. The good things in your life are coming from God. Don't blame the bad things on God. And if it is a test, it is a test that is actually a good thing. You say, Brian, that's easy for you to say. It is. I'm sorry. I don't know your journey. I don't know your story. And I wish I could make this be more true. I know mine and I know this is true. That's all I can say. And my life can either be a random, meaningless string of tragic events where I come in crying and confused and scared and that's where I'm born into the world and I exit the world in the same fashion. Or I can say, God, even in these tragic times, even in the own tragedies of my own life, the own hurts, the own my own wounds, we all have our story. God, I choose to say, what are you, what perseverance, what maturity, what wholeness, what completeness are you trying to teach me in this? I will look to you, Father, Heavenly Father, because if it's coming from you, it's a good gift. Even if it's a hard gift, even if it's a test, it's still a good gift gift. And that's mature thinking, by the way. You know who doesn't think like that? Children. Children get mad at you when you discipline them. Children get mad at you when you limit them. Children get mad at you when you ask them to do their homework, right? Homeschool parents that you're having to go through right now. Yeah. All those parent teacher conferences where you were saying, well, it doesn't sound like my kid probably sounds a little bit like him now, huh? <laughs> I'm just kidding, but well, maybe I'm not kidding. That's immature. Immature is I don't want to do my homework. Immature is I don't want to do my work. Immature is I only want to do things that make me happy and feel good. That's a child's thinking. Mature thinking, according to James, complete thinking is even hardships can shape me. It's a disciplined thinking. I can be stretched. I can be molded. I can be transformed when I allow God to bring what? Wisdom. That's the heart of it. If any of you lacks wisdom, if you don't know what to do, ask God. Start there. In the Lordship of Jesus Christ, in your submission to him, ask God for wisdom. It's one of the reasons I'm excited about our upcoming sermon series here at New Life, which is the book of Proverbs. Replete with wisdom. How now shall we live? Stop the madness. L let's just put it like we can stop this if we, if we would just be wise. Humble, prudent, moral, ethical, fair. These are, these are the ways that wise people live. And so James picks up that same thing. So he says this, my dear brothers and sisters, verse 19, take note for, so what he does, what I love about James is James introduces sort of these really big concepts. And then he says, for example, okay, so I understand you're going through hardship. Let that hardship be something that changes you rather than breaks you. Let it transform you. Let it forge you rather than break you down, right? Let your let your breakdown be a breakthrough, right? Instead of a breakdown, let's get a breakthrough. Let my let my comeback be greater than my setback, like all of that type of stuff, right? Let that be the truth. Don't use it as an excuse to sin. If you don't know what to do, ask God, but really ask God. Don't just, you know, don't just say, "Okay, God, what do you want me to do?" Oh, that doesn't sound right. And then whatever you do, don't let this hardship be the framework or the license or the excuse for your sin. For example, verse 19, and James gets brutal. Like James gets right down to the nuts and bolts of it. He says, everyone should be, for example, quick to listen, slow to speak and be angry. Yeah. For example, if you want to know what wisdom looks like, 
Start listening. Make your listening quicker than your responses. For example, one of the biggest places that you sin and I sin is what I say. I say in the heat of the moment. I say because I want a cheap laugh and be sarcastic. I say because I'm angry. I say because I'm too tired. And I say things. And he says, so if you really want to become a wise person, God gave you two ears and one mouth. So maybe listen twice as much as you talk. Slow to speak. Slow to be angry. Human anger. Okay, this is, this is something right now. In fact, here's what I want everyone to do right now. If you're watching on social media, if you're on social media, if you have any kind of social media, I want everyone right now to post, tweet, Instagram, whatever, this verse. Okay? 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because, James 1.20, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I want us to fill social media right now with James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. So post it, share it, like it. Go, if you're super autistic, go get artistic, go jump on Canva or get on your version app and make a graphic, like whatever you want to do. But everybody right now, somewhere, share that. Because if there's anything that social media truly believes, it's that human anger, anger, rage, wrath, strife, not discontent, outrage, injustice, like not that, but just pure angry. Anger doesn't do anybody any good. And yet we all think that's what's going to get us the most effective behavior. How many videos could I, could any of us find online right now where someone is just losing their mind in a ridiculous way over not being able to get their hair done or, uh, because someone confronted them or because they can't go to McDonald's and get exactly, I mean, think about all of the ridiculous things people get angry about. And James would say, how's that working for you? Human anger does not produce the kind of righteousness that God desires. That is brutal because our culture is built on who's ever the angriest and who's ever the loudest wins. Our politics are built on that. Our, our communication are built on that. Our news media is built on that. Outrage wins. But he said, but if it's not godly, it really doesn't do any good. So if you get mad, where's that anger coming from? And is it producing the type of righteousness you intended it to produce? And I'm even talking to mad about righteous things. Now, if I'm going to be angry about something or discontent or holy discontent, holy anger, because there's that concept does exist in scripture, I certainly hope I'm focusing that on the things that God actually cares about. Justice, loving my neighbor as myself, morality. That's the stuff that God wants us to be upset about. Not petty, trivial things. Not minor things. We live in a world where racial injustice is so huge and so loud and so out there, and yet so often... We are focusing our anger and outrage over trivial things. What would happen if we as people focus that into a righteous and said, we refuse to let our brothers and sisters of color be treated any less than any other person? We're, we're not going to stand for that anymore. We as a, as a kingdom of God refuse to let our sisters and wives and daughters and nieces be dehumanized and abused any longer. There's plenty of stuff to get outraged about. That life from, from the womb all the way to the tomb, not just pro-unborn baby, but truly pro-life, that the dignity of human people matters to us instead of what can I get mad about uh, you know, someone made fun of the Jesus sticker on my, on, uh, you know, of my, my fish sticker on my license plate or man, you know, the store won't open an hour earlier. This store that is stocked full of groceries, literally fruits that shouldn't even be in season a hundred years ago. I couldn't have gotten because no one had even conceived that you could buy strawberries at this time of year. I mean, all that kind of stuff. And because it's open an hour later, we're completely inconvenienced. 
We honk because someone's two seconds too late at a green light. We, we, we text our outrage. We get, we get mad when we can't have access to our, like all of these sorts of things. And what good does it do? Nothing. I don't know why I'm on this rant. Maybe I'm mad and I'm, I'm taking it out on you. I don't know, but get rid of all the moral filth. Verse 21, and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which should save you. And what is the word that's been planted in you? Very simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the outsider the way you love the insider. Now, don't merely listen to that word, verse 22, and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it's like is someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's ridiculous. You don't do that. You look in a mirror and you say, okay, I remember what I look like. Why would you come to the word of God and not remember what you're supposed to look like? The word of God is a mirror that says, this is what God's truth looks like on you, right? So what God's truth looks like on me is going to look a little different than what it looks like on you, but it's still the same truth. I may wear things a little differently, but I can't go and say, this is what I look, this is what I'm supposed to look like when God's truth is on my life walk away and then forget what that was. If I did that, I was never really paying attention. So if I come to God's word that commands me to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself, and I walk off and don't do that, that's as ridiculous as someone looking in a mirror and forgetting what they look like, that James says. But rather stare intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. What is the law? The law of love. And continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James is going to lean into something that is immensely critical because James is coming at a moment where religion under Jewish structure was about what you did. Christ comes in and it says, my faith, the faith that saves eternally is about me and trusting in me. So James is right in the middle of, but what do I do with the stuff I'm supposed to do? Paul has to figure out the same argument for Gentiles as well as Jews. James is really just doing with Jews. Jews are like, look, I'm identified by my race. I'm identified by the country I lived in. I'm identified. I'm going to heaven because I'm the right race. I'm going to heaven because I've done the right things. I'm going to be with God eternally because I believe the right things. I'm going to believe in, I'm going to be with God eternally because I've been circumcised. Like all of this sort of stuff inherently on who I am, I'm okay. And now Jesus comes along and says, that's actually not how it works. And now all they're saying, well, what about the stuff we do? And James says, keep doing the right things. Do the good things, but do them not because of the law, but because of the law. The only commands that matter. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's when you're blessed. That's where fullness comes from. Religion matters. Religion is the things that we do. And it was interesting because I, I put this in and, and um, you guys really responded last week. Religion, I, I, I personally don't see religion as a bad word. I don't. I know some people do and that's fine. And okay, I don't. Because religion is the things I do. But what I don't do is I don't depend on that religion. I focus that religion. I want that religion to matter, but it's religion done in the light of the Lordship and the grace of Jesus Christ. These things won't save me, but these are the things I do because I'm saved. And so immediately he says, okay, you think you're religious. You think you matter. You think you're great. Well, let me ask you this. He says in verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight ring on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. He didn't even go for like some egregious thing like, oh, you think you're religious, but you, you know, kick puppies and and rob banks. He said, you can't even keep your mouth shut. James says one of the most, one of the biggest indicators of your spiritual maturity is how you talk to people. My mom, dear Pat Jenkins, whom I love, she gave me all these little pieces of life advice. And I realized how much of them were just pure biblical wisdom. You know what she would say? She would say, be sweet. Just, and when and now, just be sweet. Be sweet to people. 
You say, well, what does that mean? You know what it means. Just be sweet. Don't be ugly. Don't be harsh. Don't be cruel. Don't be unkind. Just be sweet. She ingrained into me. It's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. My mother understood the power of speech as an expression of faith. You say you're religious and you can't even be nice to your kids. You can't say uplifting things about other people, people you disagree with. You're saying you're religious and you're a person of faith, but when I look at a social media feed and the things you spew out about the governor or the government or the left or the right or whomever, James would say, that makes no sense to me. I don't understand. How can you talk that way? This is why racism is so insipid and so horrific in the kingdom of God. They're incompatible. You can't say you're a follower of Christ and say these horrible things about other people. That's James, by the way. Get mad at James. Don't get mad at me. James is saying, you're, it, and here's why. Because what, what good does it do? Your religion, James says, and this is a theme that he's going to explore all throughout this book. He says, really, your religion at that point is worthless, isn't it? I mean, it's not really doing anybody any good. I love James' pragmatism. I mean, yeah, I guess it's religion, but it's just kind of, you know, it's not really doing anybody any good, is it? I mean, your righteousness doesn't matter. And righteousness, as we know, is both spiritual and ethical purity. James is reminding us that your righteousness, it's not just that you're okay spiritually, it's that you're behaving. Straighten up and fly right, James says. And he's going to build an argument on this idea of your behavior matters in faith. What you do matters. What you believe matters. What Faith matters. What you believe matters because it should and begin to transform who you are and what you do do. And James would say, what you say. James makes a challenge that very few other biblical authors make, which is, if people can't look at your words and your deeds and tell that your life has been transformed by Jesus, James would argue, I wonder if you really have been transformed by Jesus. And that is savage. That is brutal. But what is the point in saying, I follow Jesus, if I don't follow Jesus? Jesus. And you may not like where Jesus takes you. You may not like the people Jesus is telling you to love. You may not like the acts of sacrifice or the acts of generosity that Jesus is calling you to do. You may not like the humility and the deference and the submission that Jesus is calling you to. That's okay. But then you have to ask yourself, am I actually following Jesus? He says that kind of religion, a religion that doesn't keep a rein on its tongue, that, that is angry, that is impudent, that is, um, that is um, aggressive, that is mean, that is, as my mother would say, ugly. Um, that's just, it's worthless. The religion that matters, James says, in James 1, 27. That's what I call a refrigerator verse. This is when you're going to want to write down, put on your refrigerator, put on your computer screen, use it as a, the lock screen on your phone. Uh, write it on a post-it note, put it on your, your steering column, like just keep this verse in front of you at all times. This is one you're going to want to memorize, actually. As James chapter 1, verse 27 says this, Real, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Ethical and spiritual purity. The religion that matters the religion that has value, the religion that that catches, not catches God's attention, but pleases God, the religion that says that makes God look down at us and say, yes, that's what I was hoping you do, is when we just start to do stuff. And widows and orphans matter to James because James was raised probably by a widow. And James probably said, you know, there's a there's an ongoing biblical, non-biblical tradition, but historic tradition that Joseph died fairly early. That's why we don't ever hear about him after Jesus being 12. We never hear about Joseph again. So perhaps he died fairly early. And James just says, you know, we could have used the help. We could have used the help. I care about widows and orphans. I care about those who cannot take care of themselves. James says, if you ask me what real religion looks like, it's a religion that not only makes a difference in my life, 
keep myself polluted from the world, but makes a difference in somebody else's life? And that's my question. Does your quote unquote religion, does your faith, does my faith make an impact in the life of someone else? Thomas Merton says, no one goes to heaven all by themselves. And if my faith is not extending into the community that God has put me in, then what am I doing? How, what good is this? Religion that lasts forever looks to take care of others who suffer and to grow spiritually. Think about that. I am going to remain, un and a lot of us work on that, right? We want to remain unpolluted by the world. Like we really work hard on doing that. But am I looking after the people who cannot look after themselves? And orphans and widows, the fatherless, the widow, and the, and the uh, foreigner are an Old Testament concept. It's sort of this threefold un Old Testament um, example of outsiders, the fatherless, the widow, and the foreigner. How do I take care of the outsider? How do I care for the people who cannot care for themselves? People in the ancient world, wives without a husband, widows, and children without a father were the most vulnerable. So who is the most vulnerable in your world? Who is the most vulnerable in our world? Who is the outsider? And how can I express and serve them, take care of them? In their suffering, how can I look beyond my own and in their suffering, in their suffering, take care of them? It's a lot of tough stuff. And my heart is with you as you pray. And my heart is with you as you, as you search through this. And trust me, this is not easy. And I don't even like talking about it because I can't live up to it on a fair percentage of time. But I want to encourage you, re continue to read James, enjoy our time together. And really, let's let God's love, God, let, let's really let God's love change us. So thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Hope you had a great time. Look forward to seeing you. Lots of great announcements. Looks like we're probably going to do some kind of drive-in theology Tuesday here in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully you'll be able to come out to that. Make sure you're following us on all the social media as well. Uh, things are changing pretty rapidly right now in terms of meeting, not meeting, what's allowed, what's not allowed, all that kind of stuff. So you're going to want to stay up to date. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight, and uh, we'll see you next week.